Hey guys, Nick here from Grayscale Gorilla, and welcome to the quick start video for Cinema 4D Lite and Cineware. Figure we make this video for you guys that are fami maybe familiar with After Effects, have been using it, but now have the new version and have access to Cineware and Cinema 4D Lite, and maybe want to jump in and get started. So uh, I figure we'll get this quick start video out. I want to get you comfortable and familiar with Cinema 4D. Start playing around. Won't be the most comprehensive video. We're not going to get into too much detail into any specific thing, but hopefully kind of an overview of how to start playing around with some of these new tools. So let's head on in and get going. Uh, here we are in After Effects, uh, as uh, you guys are probably familiar. Let me show you the, how fast it is to get into Cinema 4D Lite, which again comes um, included in uh, in the, the latest After Effects here. So we go to File, New, Maxon Cinema 4D File, and uh, it's going to make us name it. So let's just name this uh, Quick Start. And it's going to save a file, and it's going to open Cinema 4D Lite, uh, and we're all set to go. Um, so here's the, here's the interface. And I'm going to try to explain this in a way that hopefully uh, is helpful if you guys are familiar with After Effects. Try to make some analogies and show you where certain things are. So we have a 3D interface. Um, if you've ever played around with, uh, with After Effects' 3D tools, you'll be familiar with the concept of X, Y, and Z. And uh, so let's just start navigating. First, let's just go up here and make a cube. So this is where you can grab a bunch of different primitives and objects. Um, and so let's just make a cube so we can see where we're going. And first of all, I want to get you guys comfortable with just moving a camera. Uh, so in here, we have these tools up here. So we have the Move tool, and you can just click on it and move around. You have the Zoom tool here and a Rotate tool. And this will uh, move you around the scene. Now, similarly, uh, and this is how I navigate, you could use 1, 2, and 3 on your keyboard. So um, if you hold down 1, which I'm holding down 1 right now, and move around, it's going to do the move. Hold down 2, you're going to zoom in and out. And hold down 3, and you're going to do the rotate thing. Uh, and also, specifically, wherever you click to rotate, that's where you're going to rotate. So uh, just get, get comfortable with that. We're going to be using this kind of 3-level system of navigation in a lot of things. So for example, the cube as well can rotate and scale and um, and move. So let me show you these tools. Up here we have move, the same icons here, move, or similar I guess, move, uh, scale, and rotate. So let's grab the move tool. And you're going to see we have an X, Y, and Z right on our cube that we can grab and it's going to light up. So you can see Y is lit up here when we move over it. We can go up and down. Same with Z and same with X. We also have, while we're looking at this object here, a lot of these primitives and a lot of objects will have these little orange nubs here. This allows us to actually move and scale uh, certain parameters of our object. So we could do that. If we go to our scale tool, then we could just click and drag and we could scale and make objects larger and smaller. If we go to our rotate, we can do this uh, on X, Y, and Z here and, and rotate our objects as well. So you'll see for every tool I click, you're going to see something change down here. And this is the attribute manager. And this is where you can type things directly in. So if you don't want to navigate you know, with these nubs, you want to be more accurate, uh, you can go to your cube and uh, select the cube here, and it will update. And now we can put it right in this uh, manager. So we have coordinates here. So we could zero out our cube and just say, you are now in the center of the scene. And then if we wanted to make this a perfect 90 degrees, let's say we could type this in and rotate it that way. So this is how you can kind of see the, um, the results of some of your movements and rotations for your objects. So those are the, um, those are the move tools here. Um, here you have a undo and redo. So if you just want to click on these, you could do that. And of course, uh, Command Z and all that stuff works as well. Uh, next, we have uh, some movement tools we'll get into further down. But this is um, the next thing we'll talk about, which is the render button. So we're playing around, and uh, we're making different objects. So let's grab another object here and just kind of set it on top. We have our little scene here, simple scene, but it is what it is for now. Uh, and we hit render, and what that's going to do is Kind of, kind of like in After Effects when you kind of have a low res version, and then you go to want you want to see it in its final form. You'll kind of turn up all the settings and hit render. This is kind of what it's showing you. This is like what this 3D object will look like in its final form. Because here everything's optimized, so we could rotate around it very quickly and 
and the textures are, are similar, you know, similar to what they're going to look like, but not quite perfect. You see, we have kind of jagged edges here, but when we click here, we're going to get our kind of final look or final render. Next to that, we also have um, another button that moves it into the picture viewer. So what the picture viewer is, is this is kind of like putting it into the render queue in After Effects. This is kind of more of your final render. This in, in the picture viewer as it renders, you can actually see old renders here. And you can also um, save things out from the picture viewer. So you can come up here and save out and do a bunch of fun stuff. Um, uh, so from here, what you want to do is let's get back into After Effects. So the way to get this scene back in After Effects is to basically just go back to After Effects. And this quick start was automatically applied to our After Effects scene when we made it. Okay, so let's make a new composition with this quick start. And actually, before we do, I wanted to show you one more thing. Because we want our ratio, we want our aspect ratio to be to be correct. So by default, you're going to see we're in more of this four by three aspect ratio thing here, and we want this to be widescreen, or at least I do. So let's look at this one more setting here. So we looked at render, we looked at our picture viewer, and let's go to this last one. And from here, we can just find the ratio and the and the pixels uh, and the the width and height of our scene. So in this case, I want it to be 16 by 9, so we have a little preset down here we can move to. And uh, let's say we want this to be 1280 by 720, and we have it. So now we have our settings for our scene, which means that this will correlate to our uh, scene inside of After Effects. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, the important thing to remember is you always have to save your Cinema 4D file here so I'm just going to hit Command S, save it. And when we head back to After Effects, now when we drag this and make a new composition using our C4D file, it's going to pop open the exact scene as we left it inside of Cinema 4D. So here's our scene, and instantly it pops up in here. And it also applies the Cineware layer, which uh, allows us to control some of the things uh, inside of After Effects through to Cinema 4D. So for example, right now we have our renderer on software mode. And this just gives us kind of that lower res, quick to navigate view that we saw over here. But if we want to see the final render, we have to tell Cineware that we want to do that. So there's a couple different modes. There's standard, which looks a little bit better, but we still have you know some aliasing issues, a little jaggy edges and stuff. This is kind of like the draft mode in After Effects. Um, and like always, and especially with 3D, we're always balancing between quick previews and quick navigation and then our final look and our final render, which you know usually takes a little bit longer but looks a lot better. So that's kind of what we're adjusting here. So standard, final, that's going to give us our uh, final render, all cleaned up edges and all this stuff in here. So let's um, try to make a little bit more room just so we could see all this stuff here. Okay, so now we're going to start to bounce back and forth between After Effects and Cinema 4D because that's why this was built. Um, the, the, the Cineware layer and Cinema 4D Lite allow you to jump back and forth without having to commit really to anything. So for example, let, we're back in our um, quick start scene. And uh, let's say we want to add a simple texture to this. Right now we just have this kind of gray texture. We can come down here to our texture area and say create new material and we could just drag this right on top of our scene. We can also drag it up here in our object manager right on the object itself right here. So now we have our object textured. Let's hit save and then let's go back to After Effects and you can see it instantly updates. All set, ready to go. So this back and forth jumping will be a big part of the workflow, at least for me. You know, if you want to change your camera angle and move this around, save it, jump back, and there you are. Um, and it's important to note that right now, it, whatever camera you leave or whatever setting or, or scene you leave this uh, file saved as, like uh, if we're zoomed all in here, save, it will, it will update uh, in After Effects right away. So it's important to maybe grab a camera. So let's talk about how to set up a camera. 
and it's as easy as coming up into this menu and turning on a camera. Um, so what we had before was kind of a fake camera. It wasn't really there necessarily, um, but it allowed us to kind of move and, and kind of save our place. This camera allows us to move it and kind of lock down the camera. So let me show you what I mean. Let's, um, let's, uh, let's take our objects here and find something maybe a little bit more interesting. Let's just add a few more little objects here just so we could start to play around and maybe add a new material. And, uh, you know, I'm encouraging you guys to kind of experiment a little bit so uh, you guys can learn some of this stuff. We could drag this on here, and now we have our scene, and now we have our camera. So let's say we want, like, this top-down kind of, kind of uh, camera angle. So we set it up, and we say, yes, this is the camera I want. This is our top-down camera. Cool. Let's save that. Let's come back. And by default, it will be there. But now let's say you're experimenting, you're playing around, maybe you want a different camera. You can actually copy and uh, paste this camera or just grab a new one from the menu here and call this one the front camera. And then you want to turn on your front camera. So you can see we have two cameras here. This little knob allows us to turn it on and off. So let's turn on our front camera and move it into this more frontal position. And let's hit save and let's go back. Now, the reason we set up two cameras is because I wanted to show you another feature of Cineware, which allows us to select our camera in Cinema 4D using this layer. So right now it's, it says Cinema 4D camera, which basically means whatever camera we leave it on when we save, that's what Cineware is gonna use. But we can also go say, select Cinema 4D camera, and that allows us to set a camera. And when we click that, this dialog pops up and it has the camera names that we uh, typed in right in here. So right now it's set to front. We could set it to top down and right, boom. We have both at our disposal and they both show up very quickly. And while we're talking about cameras, uh, I wanted to show you guys how you can integrate an After Effects camera into this situation. So you may be more comfortable moving around with an After Effects camera or you may already have an After Effects camera set up in your scene and, and, and animating, and you wanna use that camera. So let's go to layer, new, uh, camera, and you guys know all this stuff, I'm sure, but we're gonna make a two node camera, hit okay, and hit okay again, and you can see nothing's happening. We're not able to use this camera. But we can, if we go to our Cineware layer, which is on our C40 uh, layer here, and we go to this camera menu again and say, comp camera. Now. Depending on if you've already set up a camera or not, you'll get two different results. So if we select comp camera, you can see we have a camera and it's kind of down and to the right. Uh, and this is just a difference in translation between Cinema 4D's kind of world space and After Effects's world space. Um, so all you have to do is kind of look and if it doesn't look right, try the other one. That's the easy way to think of it right now. In this case, we need a centered comp camera and that's gonna get us back to here. Um, and that allows us to now use this, the After Effects camera to navigate our scene within After Effects without worrying about um, going back to Cinema 4D just to change a camera angle, right? Um, so let's do that. We can grab our camera and now we could use our traditional camera tools. If I hit C, I can go to my rotate tool and start to rotate around this object and get a real 3D object here. Now, of course, if you wanna see that faster, you can go to your standard draft mode, or you can go to software mode and then drag around, and then you're gonna get this kind of low res preview, but you'll be able to move around. And then when you stop, it'll update, just like After Effects does. It kind of drops down into that low res and you can play with that. But that's some of the camera options. And this stuff's really powerful because it also integrates with whatever 3D things you already have in your scene in After Effects. Okay, so let's get back into Cinema and learn a few more things about uh, what, what you can do inside of Cinema. So we played with some of these. Let's move down the row here and start to play with some of these other objects. We also, uh, so you've seen this primitive menu and you could play around with any of these. And um, let's just delete the this stuff here. We'll delete our top, uh, top down camera and let's talk about splines now splines uh, are kind of non-renderable items that you can drop in your scene and you can either use the pre-made shapes or you can kind of draw your own shape um, 
but you know what's the use of having this non-renderable object? Well, you can combine these with this uh, menu next to it, which are the which are the NURB objects. These NURB objects uh, usually use splines to create objects. Um, Kind of combining splines and nerves. So let me show you what I mean by that. The simplest way to think of it is let's grab some text and in the text itself we can actually type whatever we want. If we select our text, remember whatever we have selected, we have our attribute manager down here to allow us to change it. So we, of course we can move it. But more importantly we want to go to the object menu here and type in whatever we want this to say. So we could say quick start and we can also, uh, for example, we could change the font and the, the weighting and all this fun stuff. So we have our, our uh, spline here that has this text. But again, when we hit render, nothing happens. What we need is an extrude NURBS. So let's grab an extrude NURBS and let's talk about the hierarchy system that is in Cinema 4D that you guys may not have uh, seen before, but I wanted to show you guys how this works. Most things in cinema exist in this kind of hierarchical f structure. In other words, extrude nerves and text aren't doing anything on their own. What they need to do is be able to talk to each other. And the way you do that is make a parent-child relationship. This isn't too much different than a parent-child relationship inside of After Effects. If you go to your uh, timeline down here and you can go you know choose a parent for an object just like this and you could choose parents and children you you may be familiar with the idea of creating a null inside of after effects and parenting things to the null and moving around that's kind of what we're doing here in cinema we're using the extrude nerves as a parent and the text as a child so all you have to do is grab the text and move it on top of the extrude nerves here. And you can see the arrows will tell you what, what it's doing. In this case, when we drag it directly on top of it, it's gonna become a child and it's gonna uh, make this spline a real object. It's going to extrude it like a, like a Play-Doh set and it's going to make it a real thing. So now when we hit render, we have our type. And again, when we hit save and we go back to um, After Effects, our type is here. Now we're using our comp camera, so let's jump back to our Cinema 4D camera just so we can get the same view. Uh, but you can see it's all updated and it's all set right back in After Effects. So let's talk a little bit more about, uh, now that you know, understand that these nerves kind of require uh, a kind of parent-child situation, let's see what other changes we can make. And we're going to get more into detail in another video about type in particular. But one thing to understand is that every one of these different objects um, has a different uh, set of parameters that you can come in here and tweak. So in this case, we can make the text uh, deeper here. Uh, we can go into the caps and add a fillet and have these little bevel. Uh, there's a lot of things we could do with all of these objects. So that is the most simplest kind of NURB. The next one, and probably the the most used, uh, or the next most used in the in the menu here, is the sweep nerves. At least for me, I use this one a lot. Sweep nerves are interesting because it involves more than one level of hierarchy. So you need actually two splines to use a sweep nerves. And let me show you uh, how to set this up. So let's grab a helix, and let's grab a um, let's grab a circle. Okay, so we have a helix and a circle, and I'm just gonna shrink this circle down so we can see the difference between the two. And I'm just gonna move them over and show you guys we have two splines, again, that don't render, they don't do anything. But as soon as we in, uh, incorporate them in the sweep nerves, we're gonna see something. So let's drop the helix in there, and you're gonna see with one object in the nerves, uh, in a sweep nerves, it's not doing anything. You need two. So let's drop the circle below the helix and talk about what's happening. Um, so th what's happening is it is the sweep nerves is trying to sweep one spline along another spline. We actually have this in the wrong order, I think. There we go. So order matters with the sweep nerves. And now that we have it in the right order, I'll, maybe we can explain what's happening. What sweep nerves is doing is it's make, taking the circle and it's sweeping it along the second spline, which is our helix. So if we shrink our circle down a little bit more, you could probably see this even more. We kind of have a spring effect. And again, this is only just combining these two. So let me move this circle over. And if you can imagine, this circle is kind of being 
moved around this helix and then the the that structure is being created live using the sweep nerves so now we can play with our circle make it uh, bigger and smaller we could play with our helix and make it uh, bigger and smaller and and have more angle and we we can start to build some really interesting objects with really simple shapes so play around with these sweep nerves play around with some of these other ones I have some tutorials on uh, grayscale gorilla that go into more detail in some of these other nerves and uh, but th those are essentially how uh, they work um, so Moving moving on, we have uh, this menu, which has a lot of fun stuff to play with, specifically array. Uh, if you just drop an object into array, it's going to make multiple copies of that object. So let's turn off the sweep nerves and let's grab our array. And you can see we can make this bigger and smaller and we can make more copies and we can kind of have some fun um, creating duplicates and all this fun stuff. So that's another way to create objects. Um, play around with those and the last one we'll talk quickly about and again we'll get into more detail later is are the deformers so these are really fun uh, let's turn everything off here in fact I'll just delete this we're just playing around let's grab a cube and let's grab a bend deformer okay so we have our cube and we have our bend deformer the bend deformer if we click on it and go to our attributes you can see it has a strength value uh, it also has a size value. You kind of roughly want your deformers to be the size of your objects. That's kind of a maybe a default rule, but a good place to start. Um, and then we want to basically use this bend deformer to bend this cube. So what we want to do is grab the strength and turn it up and down. And if we look at it from the side here, you're going to see it's kind of got this like bouncing noodle thing. But nothing's happening to the cube. And again, this is because we need a parent-child relationship between the two. In this case, it goes the other way. The deformer goes below the object, and we select the object. And now when we bend, you can see the cube is bending. But notice that the cube isn't bending the way that maybe we want it to or we thought it would. It's kind of stretching out, uh, but it's not doing a real bend. It's just kind of uh, pulling on those corners the problem is is our cube does not have enough geometry to bend so this is where we get into um, some more traditional kind of 3d stuff but this cube is basically made up of six sides six polygons that are on each side of this cube and that is the default cube um, and that's great if you want a cube shape but if you want a bent cube shape what you're gonna need is more um, polygons and more places for it to bend think of it this way in after effects you can start to create some pretty complex 3d objects if you just think of adding a new solid and making a, a small solid here 200 pixels by 200 pixels let's just make some orange thing or whatever this is essentially our polygon and in 3d if you wanted to make this bent or anything you would have to create a duplicate polygon and move this and then a duplicate polygon or in this case a layer and do this and the more you have the more complex shapes you can build in 3d um, because we're working with flat objects uh, and this is true even when we make these 3d so we have our 3d kind of polygons here essentially but there's no way to make this bend in After Effects right it is it is a flat piece of of geometry no matter what we do to it and what extra polygons do is basically do what we are trying to do here which is slowly bend up over the top so let's let's show you really quickly how to add more polygons here so let's let's bend our cube and get it kind of awkward stretch here and try to add more geometry to this side so that it bends more naturally so let's go to our cube and we can see right here it says segments object segments one one and one and that's X Y and Z on our cube in this case we want our Y to have more segments and it's Y because we have our, our red as X our green as as uh, Y and our Z is blue so we know our up and down needs more segments we could turn these up and you can see right away it's starting to do more what we want it to do which is get more rounded so turn it up until it's as round as we need it to be and now you can see when we animate or move our little bend thing here that it's doing more or less what we need but if we push it too far you're gonna see we're gonna start to see segments again and again this is 
Uh, this is the nature of 3D. We're basically pushing flat pieces of geometry around um, and and pretending that they're round for the most part, right? So if you need, if you're starting to see segments, if things are starting to look too flat like that, you can always add more, especially in your primitives, by just turning up the segments. And th th these segment things exist on almost all these primitives, uh, and so experiment, play around with them, especially when you're using these deformers. You can really push and pull these polygons to where they start to uh, get too flat. So that's your that's the way to fix it there. So now you're playing around with all this stuff. You're playing around with um, with deformers, and uh, we have floors, we have skies, we have all this stuff. We'll, we we will experiment with more. But the the last two things I wanted to kind of talk about are texturing and lighting, and these things kind of combine together to create that 3D look that you might be looking for. So by default here, when we save and we go in After Effects and we see what we've built, let's turn off our silly uh, planes here. Even if we turn it on final, we essentially still have a flat gray, you know, thing. It's it's not it's not a uh, it doesn't look as 3D as it can, you know. You might want a shiny object. You w might want it to look more dramatic. You might want it to uh, be a different color. And that's where all the texturing and lighting comes in. So Let's head back into Cinema 4D and make a really quick scene and just talk about texturing and lighting. So uh, let's grab a a uh, text and let's delete, delete this other stuff. We're just playing around here, and let's say let's say this says lights. You could type your name in there. It's usually pretty fun. We're gonna uh, change the font here. You can make it whatever you want, and we're also going to add an extrude nerbs and drop the text in there. And now we have uh, turn up, turn this up, and heck, you know what? Let's just do it. Let's create a fillet cap, and so now we just have a little bit of bevel and fun stuff to play with. Okay, so we have our our plain text here, and let's uh, delete our our materials and just start from scratch and say new material, and you can apply it again either right on our scene or up in the object manager. So now we have our lights with our texture on it. So now we can come in here and talk a little bit about lights and textures. First of all, we have our color, which you know is our color of our object. If you want it orange, you make it orange. If you want it blue, you make it blue. In this case, we'll just make it all the way white, just so we can see uh, all the effects we're having. You could do things like luminance and make it a bright object, kind of like a light bulb. You can make it transparent like glass um, and play around with some of these settings, uh, but uh, be sure to always tone down your brightness a little bit uh, on your on your transparency so you can see the object in general. We're not going to play too much with, with uh, transparent objects right now, but we will in the future. Reflection, uh, of course, that's one of my favorites. Uh, you can turn this on, and by default, you're going to have this chrome kind of effect. Okay? The problem with a default chrome effect is that there's really nothing to reflect. If you have an object, a reflective object in a black room, it's just going to reflect black, right? So some of the things with reflections you need to keep in mind is that you need other objects and lights and stuff to make reflections look correct. Um, but that's how you turn them on, uh, and we're going to get more into that later. For now, let's just tone down our reflections just so we have a little bit of reflection but not much. And uh, the other one we could play with is specular. Specular gives us this this nice hot spot wherever the lights are. So let's let's start to combine lights, and we'll talk about specular and how to combine these things to get different looks. So let's grab a light. With our light, it's going to show up at zero 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 in our scene, which is right in the middle here. And a light by default, um, you kind of want to start to move around and say, where is this light coming from? So let's go ahead and move this up and to the left. And so now we kind of have a light coming from up top here. When we hit render, we have our 3D type with you know a light up here. We start to get these hot spots on our type. This isn't the prettiest thing yet, but hopefully we'll end up with something a lot better looking with just a few lights and some simple textures. So we hit render, and so let's talk about what that specular does. With no specular, we hit render, and it looks pretty flat, pretty gray. Um, as soon as we add specular and we start to crank it up, you're going to start to see a more brighter and brighter spot over here. You can see this. And in fact, if we take the color of our object and just tone it down, we could see the specular only. So let's do that for now, just to kind of illustrate what's happening. 
right now we have this nice big hot spot of a specular across the front that makes it look all blingy and nice and shaded and 3D. We, but by affecting the specular, let's say by making it very narrow, you can see now we almost have no specular except for right where the reflection of the light is right here. So you can see this has a big uh, kind of effect on our scene. So we could kind of play around and make this nice wide circu circular kind of specular. And this, all of this goes to help, you know, give detail and, and, and shadow and, and uh, a kind of a glossy look to our scene depending on how big and how wide all this specular stuff is. So play around with that. Let's leave it as is and turn it back to white. And let's talk about light. So right now we've just played with this basic light. Nothing too crazy. Let's add a simple kind of floor here. I'm going to add a disc and scale it up just so we have something for our lights to sit on. And when we hit render, you're going to see we're missing something very important and that's shadows. By default, these lights have no shadows. Uh, and let me show you some of the settings here on the lights so you can start to get more beautiful renders. So we have our basic color here. You can choose the color of the light. We have our type of light, which is an omni light at, at the moment, which just means light is going everywhere around in the scene. You can, If you've played with After Effects uh, lights, you're going to see some of this stuff is pretty similar. Also, the material um, settings inside of After Effects has things like specular and glossiness and some of the things you're going to see here. Um, and, and a lot of that knowledge will transfer into Cinema 4D. So the next thing is shadow. So let's turn on soft shadows by default here. We're going to get this kind of soft shadow falling off to the side. Um, Soft shadows render very fast, but aren't not are not very accurate. The most accurate shadow you're going to get is an area shadow, which does take a little bit longer to render. Not really in this scene necessarily, but in general, area shadows do take longer, and um, and in in an increased render time. We'll get way more into lights and stuff in other tutorials, but play around with some of these settings here. Uh, up next, we have. Uh, the ability to kind of change color. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's make kind of like a sun. So we make it kind of reddish here and uh, let's make it a little bit brighter. So now we have this kind of sunlight blasting down and let's kind of scale up our disc here. Again, we could either just use the scale tool or we have our, our radius here. That is one of these object parameters we can move. Um, and we have our sun, which we could always grab our light. And again, using our move tool, move it around the scene. So if you want the sun to come from over here, over here, you can move that around. Okay, so we have our, our bright sunlight here. And let's um, add some more lights to try to make this a little bit nicer looking. One thing we can add is kind of a global light. So if you add this light, right down here you have an ambient illumination checkbox. And what this does is just kind of cast light everywhere. So let's turn off our other light and see what this does all by itself. You can see it's kind of casting a white light everywhere we have it. In fact, if we drop our our material onto our floor as well, it's just going to be kind of this big white mess with a little bit of reflection on it, right? This is a global light and this just helps kind of bring up the general lighting in the scene. If you've ever looked at something and said, wow, that looks like 3D, you know, that has that that kind of uh, early cheesy 3D look or whatever. It's usually because there's all this black sitting here, and there's just this harsh shadow, and it's and it's not very realistic. This is um, not what we're going for. We're going. We want a more, you know we want something that looks a little bit more natural. And a good way to do that is to always add a little bit of fill light using this ambient illumination. So let's just tone it down maybe 20, 30%, 40%, play around. And already this looks much better. We have we have our little details being filled in here by this general light. We have our sun coming down and kind of hitting our, our uh, object. And we have some natural shadows happening and it's looking a lot better. We are still missing a little bit of detail in all of our uh, shadows. You can see under the T here and in between the S, it's just a little bit too even. And this is where ambient occlusion can help. So let's head on into our render settings, which you can get to right from up here. Inside of render settings, you're going to see all the stuff we played with before, the pixels, the ratio, um, some of the, the length of our scene, the frame rate, all that stuff's in here. 
But over here, you're going to see some render options and re specifically in effect right here. If you click this, go to ambient occlusion, turn it on. We could just leave all the defaults. We'll, we'll go through some of these um, settings in other videos. But for now, let's just turn it on and talk about what ambient occlusion does. Already this is looking better because the ambient occlusion is doing its job. Ambient occlusion is looking for all these little detailed shadows that exist when two objects kind of touch each other or are near each other. So you can see in the in the little cracks here of the L and in the G and in the S and in front of all these letters right here, you're seeing all this nice little detail. So let's compare uh, the two different um, renders here and talk about what this is doing. So let's tone down our sun just so we can kind of see more of the effect. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna render into our picture viewer with and without ambient occlusion and kind of talk about what, what it is. So let's render into picture viewer, good. Let's uh, go back and turn off ambient occlusion and then render into picture viewer again. One thing you'll notice is that it did take way less time to render without ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion does take some extra time, but it is usually worth it in a lot of cases. So experiment with it, but you can see exactly what it's doing. We have our scene with kind of our basic two lights, and but we're missing that detail. So just look between the, those two and see uh, ambient occlusion kind of doing what it does. This is again, just fill in all those gaps. Uh, well, we will play with that more. I just wanted to make you guys aware of it really early on because I think it's a very important part of, of uh, it's, a, it's a really important tool to, to help um, uh, give you that detail and give you more of that beautiful render you might be looking for um, without too much knowledge. You know, you come in, you hit ambient occlusion, and it looks better for the most part, usually. So we'll get more into that later, uh, but for now, I think it's important. So here's the really important thing. We have our scene set up. Let's turn off our our, um, our floor here. Talk about one more quick thing. I know I said textures and lights would be the last thing, but I forgot about my favorite part of Cinema 4D, which is the MoGraph menu. Now in Cinema 4D Lite, uh, if you register, you can get this MoGraph menu and it's uh, it's limited. It's not the full MoGraph that's included in the uh, professional versions of Cinema 4D, but we have enough here to really do some cool stuff. Even though there's only three things in here, we can combine these three things to make some really cool things. So I just want to show you so you can start to play with MoGraph. I have an entire video uh, for Cinema 4D Lite that is dedicated to MoGraph. We're going to do some more stuff, but I wanted to show you in this quick start so you can start to play around. So what we need to do is add a fracture object. Fracture object is going to allow us to break this type up. So drop your type into the fracture object and then tell the fracture object that you want to explode segments and connect. And that's going to make each object a separate or each letter a separate object. The next thing we want to do is go into MoGraph and hit random. This is going to randomize each letter according to uh, its parameter. So if we go into random parameter, you can see we can adjust how random this is. And in this case, we don't want it to adjust the position, but we do want it to adjust rotation. So we can kind of rotate this around and make a fun little type thing here that we can then save and head back into After Effects where we're more comfortable and we can see the final results. So now you can see we have a nice bubbly type here. We have it all um, uh, lit up and has our lighting and our ambient occlusion and all that stuff set up. So let's go into our text and add just a little bit of spacing just so they're not touching as much. And we can go to fracture, or I'm sorry, we can go to random and just tone this down, maybe 10 degrees. And we could do that. Okay, so let's hit save, let's head back. And you can see what we're, what's happening in After Effects is that it's opening up a version of Cinema 4D basically and rendering this out. So. It does take a little bit of time for it to render. In this case, it was you know maybe a second. And again, we could always fix that by going to things like standard draft or into software mode so we can start to see and animate and play around. So speaking of animation, let's just show you how to animate this random effector so you could start to play around with maybe some um, camera moves or, or animation effects. And the way we do that is we go to random, we go to effector, and we go to random mode and set it to something like noise. And then just click this index thing. We'll get more into more detail, I promise. But for now, you can see we have dancing letters. 
So let's specifically go to parameter and turn position back on and maybe get these things wiggling and uh, hit save and head into After Effects where we're going to see if we move our timeline, animation comes through as well. And of course, here's the best part about this integration and this workflow, which we haven't talked about enough, but I think is an important thing to understand. This entire workflow is great because we, we by having this direct link, um, we're able to jump between these two programs and be able to get nice 3D uh, into After Effects live. So what this means is when we come back here and we change this from saying lights to saying quick start, maybe even on two lines like that, then when we hit save and we go back, it is all updated, it's all ready to go. And if we go into final mode, you can see it render and there it is. So, so to me, that's the powerful part of Cineware and Cinema 4D. It is the ability to, uh, you know, for the After Effects user, the ability to start playing with a professional 3D tool like Cinema 4D is super powerful. And uh, hopefully this video encourages you to open up Cinema 4D Lite and to play around and start to integrate some of these tools that are included in After Effects into your work and get you interested in using more 3D and Cinema 4D in some of your projects. So uh, if you're having fun, if you're having pl fun playing around with all this stuff, we have a lot more Cinema 4D uh, light tutorials that will show you specifically how to integrate this stuff uh, tighter with After Effects. We have some really cool projects and uh, also, if you have the uh, professional versions of Cinema 4D or are interested in it, we have a ton of other tutorials as well where, that are more project-based where we build entire scenes and light them and, and uh, render them all out and composite them and do a bunch of fun stuff on the blog at Grayscale Gorilla. So anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you have fun with these new tools and these new workflows and keep making cool stuff. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.